started. So with that, let me go ahead, and open us up with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come together one more time to be able to just explore your word, to look and see what you have for us, Lord. We would just ask that you would speak to us and that we would be able to hear, Lord, and that we would be able to see the things that you are trying to communicate in your word to us on this topic of tithing that we're going to be discussed to discussing today, Lord, that you would give us your heart and show us uh, what you would have for us as Christians regarding this topic. Lord, I would just ask that you would be with those who have joined us, um, that they their, their hearts would be receptive to what they hear, that they will engage as they need to, so that we would have a lively discussion as needed, Lord, so that iron sharpens iron during this study. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get right to it. Let me share a screen. Give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna share my note screen. If, can you see my note screen? Anybody? Yes, okay. sir. All right, so let me go ahead and get started. So this, this topic is about uh, Creflo Dollar, as you can see here, uh, recently um, repenting um, of teaching tithing, okay? As you may or may not know, uh, for those who are not familiar with Creflo Dollar, who may watch this video later, Creflo Dollar is an uh, uh, internationally renowned pastor, um, known all over America um, because he has one of the largest denominations that are out there. So he's primarily a prosperity preacher, is what he's preached, you know, over years and years and years to kind of name it and claim it, word of faith type preaching, you know, that he learned from uh, Kenneth Hagin, another you know, folks who did that type of preaching. Um, he preaches out of Atlanta, Georgia is where he's based. Uh, he has a, a church called the World Dome. Um, they have multiple thousands of members that are spread out, like 30,000 some folks spread out over, I believe, multiple states. Um, this guy's written books, he's a speaker. You know, he just, he, he does it all within the Christian circle. And he displays a very lavish lifestyle. Okay, he has, you know, all of the things associated with that lifestyle because he is a multimillionaire. Now, you know, there's a controversy that's out there surrounding him and guys like him that, hey, look, is he that way because he's blessed by God? Or is he that way, you know, because he's fleecing the flock and teaching things that he ought not? And, you know, so there, there are people who, have, who are on both sides of that um, particular divide. Um, but like I said, he preaches nationally and internationally. Now, concerning the tithe, um, Creflo Dollar has preached some crazy stuff, all right? And he is preaching. If you see the link that I've, I've linked to, and for those of you who may watch this later, what I will do is I'll put the link in the uh, description of this video for you to just click on it from there if you need to. But if you watch this link, and it's about a two minute link, and I'm not gonna show it here because I don't you know, know how to copyright strike stuff works, so I'm not gonna show it. But if you watch it, you should have heard Creflo Dollar basically say things that are just absolutely insane um, from a Christian point of view that you know, he wants to shoot all non-tithers. Now, I think he probably is joking in that regard. I, I don't you know, believe he's really, really serious about that. Um, but some of the other things he seemed to say you know, with no chuckle that, that, that came out of his mouth, you know, like it's impossible to go to hell if you're paying your tithe, or you can't have prosperity unless you're paying your tithe. You can't have healing unless you're paying your tithe. And, you know, these are some of the things that he's preached and others like him have preached for a very, very long time. And because of that type of preaching, you know, there's a lot of Christians over the years who have felt you know, uh, fear, they have felt like they were going to be cursed, they have felt, you know, some kind of way about, hey, if I don't tithe, you know, bad stuff is going to happen to me. And so they've been locked into this type of legalism. Now, uh, and now allegedly, um, Creflo Dollars had a change of heart. And so, you know, because we're not exactly in a position to, to judge his heart in that regard, 
I put on here, he repented of his, his previous tithe teaching. Now, with that being said, am I dubious that, you know, it's a true repentance? I'm not convinced that it's a true repentance, all right? But I'm not going to sit here and say with 100% certainty that this man is not truly repentant in his heart. You can only go by, by the words that flow out of his mouth. And he's telling you that all of his previous tithe teaching is wrong and you should throw it away. But in the same vein, he's saying that he won't apologize for how he got here to this particular point. You know, so that's kind of, you know, very, very sketchy because when we see true biblical repentance, um, we see that there is a restitution um, that is spoken of in the Bible. And, um, you know, that that's the way that, that it should be. And we see this in the case of uh, Zacchaeus. For those of you who may have been uh, following the, the text thread, um, a brother brought up that very point that, hey, look, true repentance, you know, is shown by what you do after that point. And to kind of solidify that point, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to share one more thing with you real quick. Can, can you see the screen? I just shifted over. Are you still seeing my notes or are you seeing the Blue Letter Bible, Vanessa or anybody? the notes right now but okay all right well i'll shift it over i just want to show you this real fast and then i'll get right back to um what we're talking about so i'm going to go to uh a uh, new share and i'm going to go to i think is this one okay and give me one second share nope oh hold on one second do y'all see the bible share it now or no yes sir we can see it now okay so you, do you see where it says do you see malachi or do you see where it says acts it says malachi one okay hold on one second mm -hmm. let me move this all right so if you're saying that let me go to acts real quick okay so acts 26 uh 20 right here just talking about uh you know what repentance is supposed to look like right so this is paul when he's before agrippa and he's telling you know all of the things that he suffered and went through and how he was appointed to go out and preach and then he talks about um uh, the fact in verse 20 verse 20 of chapter 26 here um that he was supposed to go throughout all the coast all right he's supposed to go out to jerusalem you know all the coast and then to the gentiles because he's an apostle to the gentiles and what he's supposed to be preaching to them is that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Okay. So a part of, you know, uh, uh, repenting and turning to God is also that piece of, of doing works that are, that are meet, meet means qualified or acceptable for, uh, for repentance that truly show that you are repentant. Okay. So do we see that in the case of Preflo Dollar here is, is like I said, I'm dubious. Um, but that's not the point of this study. So I don't want to really harp on Creflo. I just want to use him as an on-ramp to the topic that we're going to be talking about so that we actually understand this for ourselves. So if you've had an opportunity to watch the four-minute video, um, good on you. You've already seen it. You know what he has to say in reference to his uh, repentance. And if you haven't seen it, you know, I would have ask you to avail yourself of that time is only four minutes long and you can make a determination for yourself of what you think about that so with that unless there are any uh, quick uh, questions or comments uh on the creflo piece of it that's about all we're going to hear about creflo the rest of this uh topic um so is there anything from anybody i'll hold for about 10 seconds or so and if not we'll keep it moving okay not hearing anything. So the primary scripture that we're going to be taking a look at today is the book of Malachi. And I'm going to shock y'all. Um, yeah, we're going to read all four chapters. There are four short chapters. and probably going to take us about a good quick 10 minutes um, to read through them. But I want to read through these chapters. For years and years and years and years, I've heard preachers stand up and preach out of Malachi chapter 3. And they will get to the famous, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. Wherein have we robbed ye? In tithes and in offerings, you are cursed with a curse. Even this whole, and by the time they finish saying that, you shrinking down in the chair, you know, especially if you haven't paid, you know, your full tithe or you might be a little bit behind or whatever the case may be, you sitting there like, oh my goodness, you know, this is serious business and I'm going to be 
you know, on the bad side of God, you know? And so therefore, you know, this is a serious deal. But then something funny happened one day. And I don't even remember, I don't even know if Vanessa remembers this uh, story, um, but we were in church one time and there was a pastor that was preaching about the tithe. And this pastor started ranting and raving about how the people weren't paying their tithes and how they weren't giving right. And he's slamming his hands down and all, all of this. Then all of a sudden he says, and I quit. I quit, all right, because you guys aren't paying the tithe. And he walked out. And I remember feeling horrible, like, wow. You know, we as a church body just made this dude quit because, you know, we're not doing our responsibility. And then after that, I'm like, you know what? I need to make sure I understand, you know, everything I, there is to understand about the tithe. And so I started reading about the tithe. And for the first time, years and years and years ago, I went back and read all of Malachi and not just the part that they say in the pulpit. And what I read actually shocked me. And it gave me a whole different perspective um, after reading that and then reading other portions of the Bible as far as what the tithe was all about. So if you read it all in context, as you see here on the screen, it should help you greatly understand the famous will a man rob God question slash accusation that's used as a spiritual weapon of fear and it's perpetrated on guilt-ridden Christians during offering time because they feel like they're cursed with a curse if they don't tithe, all right? So this is, in my estimation, and hopefully by the time we get through the study, maybe you will agree with me, maybe you won't. But I believe this is a scare tactic that is employed by many pastors across America, and Creflo, obviously, he used to be one of those pastors. So for secondary scripture, probably at the end of this, we'll, you know, or, or through these questions, we'll take a look at Genesis, we'll, we'll hit maybe Luke and 2 Corinthians. Um, but this portion of it, I wanted to open it up and start talking and asking some questions. But before we do that, obviously, as you can see, the first question is about Malachi. I want to go to the book of Malachi, and I want to actually read this. So let me share the screen. Let me go back to Malachi. And I know some of you may have different Bible versions than the one that is on the screen. I use the KJV. But for this, since I'm going to be reading it through, and I'm kind of a fast reader, okay? So it might be helpful for you to follow along on the screen. If you don't want to, uh, feel free to follow along with, with what you have. Um, but I just wanted to warn you of that that I am a little bit of a fast reader and with the difference in translations, I don't want you to get lost. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This is chapter one of Malachi. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not on the screen. It's not it's on not the screen. I'm glad you told me that. Hold on. There. Let me share. All right, what do you what do you see now? So you had it and it went off. Okay. Something you just pushed it on and then it went back to this line, this bar. Okay. So you just need to bring it back open. I think it's to the left. This is Malachi 1. Hold, hold, hold on a second. Hold on. There it is. Oh, it came off. It came off. Hold on. Just give me a second. I'll, I'll, I'll figure this out. Okay. Is it there now? Yes, Malachi 1. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Let's go ahead. Let's keep it moving. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished and will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people of, against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord be magnified from the border of Israel. A son honoreth his father, and the servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. 
And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means that he will regard your persons, that he will regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle a fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, and that ye say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness it is, is it? that ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth, and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Chapter 2, and now, O ye priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have, all, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung on your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law was of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have we not all one father? Hath not God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this, is, and this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, and with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet he had the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. And ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delighteth in them, or where is, the, where is the God of judgment? Chapter three, behold, I will send my messenger 
and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner, refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. And I will come near to you, I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swears and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, it is, a vain, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that could tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And, the, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Chapter four, last chapter. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, Shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto them in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi one through four, read completely through, and hopefully you're able to get the context of what's happening and what's going on now that you have read through from one to four um, and you consider what it is talking about uh, when it talks about will a man rob God. So it's question and answer time. So I would ask you um, to engage if you feel so inclined, because if you don't, then I'm going to give you answers. And it's just going to be a one-way conversation. I'll do that, but it's, it's a little bit more fun if, if we all engage here. So I got some questions. And as I said, none of these questions have anything to do with Crestwell Dollar. Dollar. So all of these questions are about the tide. So I'll go right into it. So question one, 
Um, oh, let me go back to my notes. That way people who may view this later can actually see this. Okay, so hopefully my notes are up. Can you see my notes? Yes. Okay, so question one, uh, who is Malachi addressing in general? And then a little bit more sp sp specifically, we see this pointed out, uh, Malachi 1.1 1, 1, and then Malachi uh, 2.1. So who wants to answer that? Let's talk. He's talking to Israel. Okay. Yeah, if we go back to Malachi 1.1, 1, 1, it's talking about the burden of the Lord um, uh, to Israel, you know, by, by Malachi. So the, the people group that are being dis that are being talked to here, that are in the mind of God here for this message, is the nation of Israel itself. And then more specifically, he points out a group of people within the nation of Israel. Who is he pointing out specifically? The, the priest. priest. The priest. He's pointing out the priest. Okay. Um, so he, he's obviously talking about the, Levit the Levitical priesthood, um, which he had established. Okay, all right, so, so let's keep it moving to, to question number two. So you'll see some of these questions I kind of put scripture against, and we'll take a look at some of that scripture. Now, some of these que uh, questions I left open because I wanted you to think about it and just provide your honest assessment. Doesn't mean that you're right or wrong, but it's, it's your assessment. So question number two, what was the primary problem that God had communicated um, you know, through Malachi. Anybody? What was the primary problem that God had? All right. I thought I'll, I, uh, I was gonna go ahead, Carrie. Offer some uh, perspective, uh, brother. So, you know, just going back to what was said before god's people the israelites you know they had these people were gone astray and even more so the priests had even turned from the lord right and even the priests you know they were not even treating the sacrifices seriously that they were supposed to make to god i mean you had animals with blemishes and were being sacrificed when, when, when God specifically says in Deuteronomy 15, 21, that the lot of men, these animals be without defect. Yep. And then you had uh, these men in Judah, they, they were, they were uh, you know, treating their wives, you know, disrespectfully, churchishly, whatever you want to say. But, and then they had the audacity to wonder why God wouldn't accept these sacrifices. <laughs> and um, so, the, 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 the one thing about this, as I, as I was reading it, even though they were sinning and they had turned away from God, you know, Malachi, Malachi kept reiterating God's love for his people, right. you know, and, and, and promising of, of the coming Messiah. Right. So that is just my uh, input. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, brother. That was, that was great. Uh, I appreciate that. Anybody else? Um, have any thing that they want to chime in as far as to the problem that God had communicated by the prophet Malachi to the nation of Israel? Anybody else? If no one else, then uh, I have a few thoughts, but I'll pause for a second. And bro, one more thing. I'll just say from my standpoint, God is not pleased when we don't obey him. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, not only is he not pleased, I would go a step further than that. Um, God is angry. Um, he is angry with uh, the nation of Israel here. I mean, he talks about, um, you know, if he's a father, where's his honor? You know, and, and why don't you have any fear of the Lord? You know, you despise my name. So, and then he says, you know, I'm a great king. You know, would you do this with, with, with your governor, you know, there in the, in the earth? You wouldn't do this and get away with this. You know, so why should you do this to me? I'm the creator and, and the author of life. How do you not realize 
you know, that you have to show me so much uh, greater honor. You know, I'm the same God that has, has delivered, you know, you out of Egypt. You know, I'm that great God. And this is how you treat me. This is how you profane my name. This, you know, is what you do. So he has a huge problem, you know, to the point where he gets in Malachi chapter two, verse three, and says, I will spread dung on your faces. You know, when God is saying something like that, God is upset, okay? So God is a God of love. He is, and he has a great and um, an abiding love. Why? Because uh, uh, of the promise that he made to Abraham that his seed would be as the sand uh, uh, of the seashore and as the stars of the sky. So he's not going to wipe out the nation of Israel, you know, for, 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 you know, the fact that he will keep his word. So he has a, a great and abiding overarching love in that standpoint, but he has a specific issue and problem with what's going on here. And he lets them know in no uncertain terms how he feels about it. So, okay, so I'm not gonna over talk it. Um, if nobody else has any uh, comment on that particular question number two, we will go to question number three. And if anybody wants to go back to question this or that, you know, as we advance, then, then feel free to do that. So that's, that's not a problem. So I ask you to do a word search um, in your Bible, in the scriptures for the word tithe and tithes. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what did you notice if you did the word search, you know, and you looked at the word tithe and tithes in this particular uh, instances in scripture, you know, was it more so talking about, you know, food? Was it more so talking about money? What, 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 what is it talking about? We understand that the word tithe in, you know, a, a pure, you know, sense means a tenth. But when that tenth is talked about in scripture, uh, what did you notice? And while you guys are contemplating that and somebody might uh, want to share, I'm going to go back to the scriptures. And I'm going to just type in, type in the word just for those who may watch this later mm -hmm. and, um, and see. So what did y'all find if you did a word search? What did you notice? Anybody? In that case, there's a scripture that it was in the middle of man the possessions. One's possessions, and in, in particular, if you look at the exactly the book of Leviticus uh, 21 and 22, we see how God isolated and consecrated the Levites for special service, first for the tabernacle, and then later on for the temple. Um, the Levite, the Lord was going to be their inheritance, so it was never hard, it was hardly a monetary, it was more on the line of food and possession than agriculture. Okay. All right. I think I heard somebody trying to chime in with you. Thank you, Brother Mikhail. Um, you say you felt what you found it was more so agriculture. Um, I think somebody was trying to chime in with you at the same time as you were talking. I don't know if it was Brother Kerry or, or, or Tim. Okay. It must not. Maybe I, I, I misread that. Okay. All right. So any, any other comments on, on that? If, if you did the word search and you took a look, if not, that's okay. So for, for the purpose of somebody who may watch this later, uh, for whatever reason, I, I just typed in the word tithe, right? So if you look at this word tithe, and I'm not going to go through every instance here because we don't have time for that. But if you notice the word tithe, it's talking about, you know, seed of the land, herd of the flock. Um, you know, it was given to the Lord as a heave offering. And then the priests, they had to give a tenth of that tenth a tithe of that tithe that they received. You see, you know, a tithe of corn or of wine or of oil, tithe of the increase of the seed, tithe of corn or wine or oil again, tithe of the increase the same year. It's talking about uh, from the land, the increase of the field, the tithe of all things that are bought in abundantly, tithe of oxen and sheep. Um, you, you just see this again and again. Um, you know, again, corn and new wine, uh, mint, and as this is Jesus talking here, tie the mint, anise, and, and cumin. So you see, in my estimation, you see a pattern, okay? That primarily the tithe is referencing, you know, agricultural product, um, is referencing, you know, vegetation, 
you know, things like that. And then same thing, I'll just quickly on the tops because I think <clears throat> this word appears a whole lot more times. Okay, this is Abraham giving the tithes of all. And we'll go back to the Abraham passage. Um, this is talking about uh, redeeming a tithe, and we may talk about that a little bit. Um, tithe is offered as a heave offering unto the Lord. Um, it was given to the Levites for their inheritance, and they should offer it up as a heave offering. Even the tenth part of the tithe, that's what I was saying. So the Levites got the tithe from the nation of Israel. They had to offer a tenth part to, to the Lord um, themselves. Um, they received tithes from the children of Israel, heave offerings again, tithes of the increase of the third year. So I'm looking for where it says tithe. You know, I want you to tithe some money to me. So I, that's, that's what I, and when I, you know, watch that pastor quit and walk away, this is what I was looking for, okay? Um, and, and, and tithe of the ground, tithe, you know, of the cities of our tillage, you till the ground. Um, so you, you go through this, and again, I'm not going to go through all of this, tithes to gather out of the fields, corn on new wine. You kind of get my point. Uh, well, at least I hope you get my point. That primarily what Brother Miguel is, is, has alluded to here is that the tithe was primarily agricultural and mm -hmm. vegetation. So when the pastor stands there today and he's reading from Malachi under the Old Covenant, all right, and the Lord has kind of broke down what he's meaning by tithes, because scripture defines scripture, then, and the priest, and the, and the pastor is telling you to bring money, um, we don't see that here, okay? We, we don't see that. The, the primary purpose of the tithe was for the Levitical priesthood who didn't have, you know, um, any inheritance, and it was primarily, you know, vegetation. So again, here we are in Malachi right here. By the time we get out of Malachi, you know, you're robbing God of tithes and offerings. You should already kind of know what the tithes what it means, okay, at this point. And this is why God is talking to Malachi about diseased animals. You know, he's not talking about, you know, a torn money. He's talking about torn animals. You know, he's not talking about, you know, your, your dollar bills are looking sick. He's talking about these animals are looking sick, okay? And then, of course, the tithes were to be brought into the storehouse and, and, and all of that. So, Again, that's what I see when I go through scripture. Now, I will say, because there may be somebody who watched this video later, or maybe one of you right now who are thinking, hey, you know, but I do remember some type of money component um, that was mentioned alongside the tithe at some point. And if you're thinking that right now, you would be right, and we will show you that. And uh, uh, we will talk about that in accordance with the video. So that will come up a little bit later, but you can see, the primary purpose of the tithe and what the tithe is, you know, meant for, it was agricultural and, and vegetation. Okay. So with that, uh, let me go back to my questions and go back to sharing the questions. And I just want to make sure that you can see the questions. Uh, can you see the questions again, Vanessa? Um, yes, you can see the questions, but I also wanted to just throw in this quick um, thought. As you said in your very first um, Bible study with um, the once saved and always saved study that when we're taught from whatever denomination we're taught from or we go to church or we're taught from our parents, that sometimes we get these preconceived notions that because the word taught that a tithe is a tenth of money of our paychecks, of the first of our check, um, we're taught that and, until you do the actual research and the study on your own and put in what a tithe is our thoughts are centered around what we have been what we've been given and, and shown throughout our our church attendance or throughout you know just regular every day hearing it from either pastors what we've known from our families i grew up in a household and i still am in a household where the tithe is very important to my parents and i don't think there's any concept of anything other than the tenth of their money the first, the first fruit of their money. So it's not about agriculture or anything else that the actual definition of tithing is. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. You know, we're, we're a product of what, you know, we're taught, right? As, as baby Christians, we go to church and we place a lot of uh, faith and trust in those people who are appointed over us to watch over 
our souls is what the Bible says, okay? And I'm not saying that every person that gets up and preaches the tithe is, you know, uh, doing it maliciously, okay? Some people teach what they've been taught, okay? They learned it from what they believe are very uh, renowned men, holy men, um, respectable men, and therefore they want to model what they see and they want to teach in that vein. And so when they do that, a lot of them don't allow themselves to have independent thought because they don't want to step outside of the line. You don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to be the one person, the guy or girl, girl that is walking through, you know, everybody's marching this way, supporting one thing, and you marching through the crowd the opposite way. You know, you know human nature for most of us don't, you know, want to have that type of uh, um, bad feelings. But you have to go back and, and study these things. You have to be a good Berean. Uh, the Bible commends the Bereans who check Paul. Now, Paul was a mighty apostle, but those Bereans check after Paul. And you guys should be checking after me or your pastor or anybody else is teaching you anything because the Bereans were commended as noble because they checked after what they were being taught to see if those things are actually true. And you have to make sure that folks aren't isolating scriptures and not properly harmonizing scriptures when they should be. Otherwise, you can have a whole, you know, mess of a skewed doctrine or false doctrine. So there's a distinction between the two. There's stuff that's totally wrong, all right? Somebody tells you, hey, Jesus Christ did not rise bodily from the grave. Well, that's heresy. That's totally wrong. And then there's stuff that's just skewed where they're only teaching one half of it. Well, God is love and he loves, you know, everybody because he sent his only begotten son. Well, that's true. But that same God of love who says he changes not also is angry with the wicked every day. All right. So we have to balance these things out, harmonize these things and make sure that we understand in, um, scripture in its totality. And then, you know, um, you can, you know, contemplate all of the things that you're hearing from other different places and, and uh, you know, let the Holy Spirit continue to teach you and guide you. And remember, not everybody's going to be at the same point, right? So just because you understand something and you think you got it down, um, you may not have always had it down. Um, and so you may be a little bit more advanced than somebody else. Somebody may be a little bit more advanced than you. Uh, we're all members of the body and we all help one another. This is why the scripture says iron sharpens iron. Okay, so we're here to help one another and build each other up in the faith. So with that, um, let's continue to move unless there's any other comments. I think we're on question number four right now. What is meant by the storehouse in, in, in Malachi 3.10? Um, is the New Testament church buildings, is, is, that a, is that the storehouse? Anybody? No. I think I heard Brother I Kerry. Yes, sir. I was just going to jump in just, just to say um, the storehouse in, in verse 10, that was a place where uh, the Israelites, when they bring their offerings to the temple, that was a place to store the grain in the temple. Yep. All right. So now you can understand, you know, maybe a little bit better, you know, that when, when God is saying through Malachi that there may be meat in mine house, you know, he, he, he's expecting there to be meat. It was a place where they would put uh, the, the storage of food and stuff like that. So, so the church today, you know, and when I say the church, I use a term loosely, to, you know, in the term that most people are understanding it for the video purpose is these buildings that they've set up, you know, that, that's not the storehouse. That's not, you know, where, what God was intending in, in Malachi. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, what we have today than what they had back then in the Old Testament times in Scripture. So thank you, Brother Carrier. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. All right, so who paid tithes and who received tithes? So as y'all are contemplating who might want to jump in on that, I'm going to go back to sharing Scripture. And I think uh, we were looking at numbers. Who paid tithes and who received tithes? Anybody? 
And for the purpose of this, since um, we got, we're good on time for right now, I'm going to go down to numbers here, 18, 21, and I'm going to actually read it through 32. And like I said, since I read fast, it should be, you know, relatively quick. So starting at verse 21, talking to uh, God is talking about what has been given uh, to Levi through, through Moses. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of congregation, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear the iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel, they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, when you take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for an inheritance, for your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this is your heave offering, uh, and this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the, tr of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye shall also offer a heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes which ye receive of the children of Israel. And ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord of all the best thereof, even the hollow part of, out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the wine press. And ye shall eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. And ye shall bear no sin by reason of it, when ye have heaved from the best of it. There, neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. So again, um, as we look at, you know, what that scripture is, is saying there, to go back to the question, you know, um, you know, what was this all about? Who paid tithes and, and who received the tithes? Well, I think it's obvious, you know, the children of Israel, you know, they the word one who paid the tithes, and then it was given to the Levites, and I think we can all come to an agreement that you know, the idea of the was under the old, um, the old covenant. But uh, later, I just wanted to drop this one little thing in there on um, the same topic in Acts chapter 5. And immediately, like right, Barnabas, who, you know, after the time, you know, after Christ ascends and goes to heaven, Barnabas, he comes, who is of the tribe of Levi, the Bible notes, and he gives everything that he has and leaves it at the feet of the apostles. Right, right. So we're talking about, you know, for one one method tithing and then we get into the new covenant you know christ has ascended and then we see people you know laying everything at the apostles feet and having all things common and we may get to that towards the end of this uh, a little bit as well as we talk about the christian responsibility towards this so let's i think we've answered the question about uh who paid and who received the tithes um uh obviously the children of israel paid the tithes and and the levites they received the tithes for their service um, to the Lord. All right, so the purpose of the tithe, uh, I think that's probably answered as well um, in that reading. Um, but if anybody wants to chime in as to uh, uh, the purpose of the tithe, was it to enrich the priests uh, with money? Was it to pay uh, the mortgage for the storehouse? Was it to, you know, the purpose of the tithe? You know, if it's mostly agricultural there, you know, there's a purpose for it. And I think as we read those, those verses, you know, we see, you know, the tithe actually being uh, eaten, all right? And that would make sense if it's agricultural in, in nature. So does anybody uh, have any uh, heartburn with what I just said or want to add on to what I just said? I'll wait a few seconds and we'll keep it moving. Okay. So let's talk about question seven then. Tithing. Now, this is where a lot of people will get hit, right? They'll, 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 they'll get stumbled, you know, in some of these churches 
when the, when the pastor will hit them with this. Tithing was before the law of Moses. This was something that existed before the law. This, so tithing don't have not, nothing to do with, you know, you don't have to worry about that it was a part of the law. It was existed before the law. So therefore, if it existed before the law, you should be tithing uh, just like it was before the law. God just, because those people's hearts were hard, God just had to make them tithe. But you as a Christian, filled with the Holy Ghost, your heart shouldn't be hard. You should have a transformed heart, a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone, and you should uh, be tithing. Okay, so I acknowledge, uh, as a course of the study, that tithing did predate the law, okay? There, to me, there, that is indisputable. Um, if there's anybody who thinks differently on it, feel free to come off mute and say, hey, I disagree with you, and we'll have that conversation. But to me, I see it as indisputable. Why? Because you see it in Genesis, okay? And Genesis is prior to the law. You see Abraham paying a tithe to um, Melchizedek. And because of time, I think I'm going to uh, not hit all of these verses. I'll just talk to them. And if we need to go to one or two, I will, because there's some other ones that I definitely want you to see. Um, but in Genesis, I think y'all know the story. Um, there was a great war in Genesis chapter 14. And, and Abraham's nephew Lot was taken and a bunch of his uh, uh, the stuff was taken and Abraham gets wind of this and you know he goes out to rescue Lot and, and bring him back and, and recapture uh, the possessions uh, from that particular campaign of, of war. And then he's met by uh, Melchizedek, you know, who is, uh, whose name literally means a king of peace and king of righteousness. And Melchizedek brings him uh, bread and wine, is what the scripture says. And then Abraham pays him um, a tithe. Now, the question that I had for you, if you did the reading in Genesis chapter 14, um, whether you read the whole chapter or just the verses, is did you notice if Abraham was commanded to pay a tithe to Melchizedek, or did he do it out of his own free will? So anybody who might want to tackle that question. Miguel, I see you came off mute. Yeah, it was voluntary. Absolutely. It, it was voluntary. You see nowhere in scripture, as the narrative of this story progresses, that Abraham was commanded to do this, okay? We don't see the command for uh, uh, tithing until a little later. But we also have another example of tithing. You see another uh, sub-question there. Uh, what about Jacob? Um, now, I do want to take a look at this scripture. Uh, and as I go to this scripture, the question is, was Jacob commanded to tithe, or did he decide to do so of his own free will? So I'm going to switch over to, uh, to uh, the scripture here, and we're going to take a look at that passage, because there's another question that comes up after that. So what about Jacob? Was Jacob free will, or was he uh, commanded to do so? Anybody? Yeah, that's an easy one. If y'all don't answer, I'm going to answer for you. Vanessa, you came off mute. Go ahead. Was Jacob commanded to tithe, or did he command of, of his own free will? No, he made a vow. Um, so... He made a vow with his own free will. He made a vow to God. Okay. Due to the why he made that vow. So it was his own free will, but it was a vow that he made. Okay. So we don't see any place in scripture where he's absolutely commanded by God. And here's a scripture reference um, on the screen right now. Is this sharing with y'all? Can y'all see this? The scripture in Genesis? Okay, good. All right. Uh, verse 20 through 22, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again into my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee a tenth unto thee. All right, so we don't see a command for Jacob to do this, okay? Just like Abraham, his grandfather, we see that he's decided to do this, and he has a reason for why he wants to do this, and that leads to the next question. Um, was Jacob's tithing vow to God conditional or unconditional? 
Anybody? Miguel. It was conditional because we see the amount of times he uses the word F. Since F is God who put me and keeps me in that, and, you know, he uses F numerous times. It's yep. conditional. All right. So this, is, this goes back to what I was talking about in previous Bible studies. These ifs in the Bible, all right? They have a reason for being there. So that sets a condition that if God will do this stuff, he says, I will do this. And the obvious is, the, the opposite is if God doesn't do this, then he won't do that, all right? So this is a conditional statement. Um, he was not commanded to do this. He wanted to do this apparently out of his own free will. So I'm gonna go uh, to the next uh, question and to try to keep it moving for us. Hopefully it's back to the questions on the screen. If somebody give me a thumbs up if that's the case. And I got a thumbs up. So let's go to question eight. When the tithe, when was it? Oh, I misworded this question. All right. When was the tithe made a requirement under the law of Moses, under the Mosaic law? We're going to skip this one because it's, the answer is already given in the actual question. I messed that question up and forgot to go back and fix it. But I do want to actually read in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14, because there's, this is, remember I told you that it's mostly agricultural about the tithe, uh, but there, there was a component of money at, 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 at you know, in, in a specific point. And I want to show you where that is. So let me go to new share. 1424. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Let me see, where, where was, uh, Deuteronomy 14, I want to go. To, yeah, I want to go to Deuteronomy. It's fourteen twenty four. It starts off with. Oh, don't do this to me! Don't make me spell it. Don't do that. Okay, fourteen. Okay, it was trying to make me spell it, and I would have. I would have been hard pressed. So I actually want to again. I want to quickly read some verses to you for you to consider to properly put this, you know, um, into context. So let me look at Deuteronomy 14. I think it's, I wanted to start at 22. Hold on one second, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, I'm gonna start at 22. Uh, this is talking about the tithe. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that thou bringest, uh, that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat the, eat, before the Lord thy God in the place which thou shalt choose, he shall choose to put his name there. The tithe the corn of the corn of thy wine and of thy oil and of the firstlings of the herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money and bind up the money in thine hand and thou shalt go to unto the place which the lord thy god shall choose and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth and thou shalt eat there before the lord thy god and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household and the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. And at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all of the tithe of the increase of the same year and shall lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So there was a, a money component to this. Did you catch that? All right? So if the place that they needed to go to offer their tithe was too far, they could take and turn it to money, and then what they were supposed to do was buy whatever their soul lusted after, um, and they were to have a meal and celebrate and rejoice with their household before the Lord, okay? That's how that was supposed to be done. Obviously not leaving out the Levite because they have no inheritance. That's that, that one of the instances of money portion that you know the scripture talk about 
right there. All right, so I want to keep it moving because we're running uh, short on time. If anybody has any comments about that, you're more than welcome to add two. If not, Gary. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. I had a, uh, just a quick question. Um, if you read further down to verse 28, uh, all the way towards, uh, where does it say? Oh, 29. It says, uh, it talks about foreigners. Yep. And the fatherless widows. Mm hmm. So would that be translated into uh, orphans nowadays and uh, foreigners would be maybe refugees, we'll say? Yeah, so, so that's exactly what it would be talking about, um, uh, orphans. They, so, so you had the nation of Israel, and then you would also have, you know, some people who were joined to them who weren't originally of the nation of Israel, but they would live as the people within the nation of Israel. And so therefore, you know, God is saying, hey, don't forget these people either, all right? You know, especially the orphans, especially the widows and the strangers that are there, you know, so, sojourning with you and kind of living under the same rules, take care of them as well. You know, so there were rules to take care of the Levites, there's rules to take care of the people. There was other agricultural rules that were in place that, you know, as a nation of Israel would, you know, harvest their lands. They weren't to harvest the corners of it so that the people, you know, could come in and glean from the corners and eat the leftover stuff. So God had a way of providing um, for the people. And, the, and, and if they would have done it God's way, then the people were supposed to be a light unto the rest of the nations. And that's the way God set that system up. So hopefully um, that answered that question or at least added a little bit more to what you were uh, saying there. So with that, I'm gonna keep it moving. I think we're at Jesus, all right? Question, question number nine, did somebody say something? Okay, no. Did Jesus address tithing as a requirement pre-cross? And we need to look at this because when, you, when we're talking about Jesus, we need to see exactly what Jesus uh, had to say. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to scripture here real quick, and we're gonna go to Matthew. And we did, both of the verses basically say the same thing, so I'm not gonna go to both. Um, they're kind of uh, parallel passages of one another speaking on the same same topic. So I think uh, I will hit Matthew. This is Jesus speaking, all right? And he's speaking to the Pharisees um, who were hip hypocritical, but the Pharisees did do some things right, you know? Um, and Jesus actually points that out in, in this verse here. Uh, as he's telling them, whoa. So Matthew 23, 23, Jesus speaking, saying, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay a tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done and not to leave the other undone. So Jesus actually acknowledges the fact that the Pharisees are paying tithes. And he acknowledges the fact, and he further says that that was not to be left undone. The Pharisees' problem here in this particular verse in the topic that he's talking about was that they were neglecting some other things. Tithing was not one of the things that they were neglecting. They were doing that right, but they were doing the other things wrong. So you're not going to see Jesus. Remember, this is pre-cross. This is before Jesus dies on the cross. So Jesus is you know, here to fulfill the law. You know, he, he's not gonna break the law. He's gonna explain the law to you, give you the, the, the deeper understanding of the law. He's gonna elevate your responsibility in the law as necessary, but he's not gonna have you break the law. And it was codified into the law that tithes were to be paid. And so Jesus, uh, who upheld the law and fulfilled the law, obviously, would have said that that was to be done. And that's exactly what he said. And this is said pre-cross, before a New Testament is ushered in. So with that, uh, let's go on to the next uh, questions. And if anybody has anything as I'm transitioning back and forth, feel free uh, to chime in. So we're gonna try to wrap up because we're right at 9, 10. Hopefully we can get this done in about another 10 minutes. So question number 10, did the apostles address tithing as a requirement for the Jews 
post cross? And if so, can you point where, it's, where, where that is in scripture? And if they didn't address this, why do you think they didn't? Then this is where I left it open for you to just talk and research as you felt the need to. So what do you think? Did the apostles address this? Was it a requirement? Um, the Jews who were familiar with tithing, you know, did they come back and reiterate that and says, hey, you will still tithe? You know, did they talk about this? I mean, what? What do you think? Anybody? Hey, Brother, I got a quick question for you. So, yes, sir. In the, in this in this instance, are you referring to Acts fifteen when there was the the um, talks about the council where they came together to talk about um, you know what would apply. Uh, what I guess, what customs and laws would apply to the Gentiles? So I didn't have that particularly in mind, but you, okay. can, you can weave it in as 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 you need to if you're trying to make a point by that. So go ahead. I think he's. Are you talking about the in Acts 15, 5 and six, as far as the Pharisees and the apostles and the elders? No, I think what Carrie is talking about, and you know, without going there, because like I said, I'm almost almost at time, mm -hmm. is there was a council among uh, the apostles who basically said, "Hey, look, you know, what's going to be applicable? You know, are 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 we going to teach them this or that? Because right. you know, um, you guys had the law, you guys know the customs and all of the rest of this, but you know, these Gentiles have never had this stuff, and so therefore, what's going to apply?" you know to them who have never a part of the you know mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh god given the covenant and, and stuff like that what's gonna i think that's what more so what carrie was alluding to but what i'm trying to allude to is was there any specific instance in the scripture where it says you know you must tithe no. you must continue to tithe or do we see something else different in scripture? And if we see something else different in scripture. Jesus said that it's finished, but he lost, he came on. So you're not gonna find that. And I, I'll actually think about Acts 15 when um, they told, when we were talking about the Gentiles, and he told, we, we should not bear, put a, no, a, 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 no other burden on the Gentiles. Yes, yeah. I've seen from idols, um, but for everything, um, for blood, for medication. So if it was that important, they would have put tithing there. So the fact that it was left out, I mean, I think it's self-explanatory. Yeah. So I think I think if it was a if it was an obligation that was supposed to be carried on, I think it was you know easy to be reiterated if they wanted to uh, throughout the New Testament. But I don't see it, you know. Um, but I'm not infallible, and that's why I'm asking the question. That's why I left it open. You know, maybe somebody sees something different than me, and if so, um, by all means, point it out. If you think that tithing is taught after the cross. Uh, whether it be to, you know, Jew or, Jew or Gentile, because after the cross, we're all part of the church, you know? So we, we have to see that this is applicable, you know, um, um, in that instance. So, yeah. uh, all right, unless somebody else had another point, I'm going to keep it moving. All right, so the next question is basically the same thing. Do we see it preached as a requirement to the Gentile believers post-cross? And I think I can go out on a limb and say that y'all would agree with me that we don't see that tithing is taught um, to the Gentiles as a precept post-cross. Um, and if somebody disagrees with that, by all means chime in as I go into the next question. Uh, the next question being, are Christians under the, Mosa under the Mosaic law or under grace? That should be a relatively easy one. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Christians are not under the law. We're not saved by the law, all right? Scripture is very plain and simple. You know, uh, we're saved by grace um, through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, all right? So we're not saved in the same fashion, you know, uh, um, that, you know, God had granted uh, people to become saints through their faith and works in the Old Testament law. So it's a little bit different for us. So with that being said, Still, 
is it a sin for New Testament Christians to tithe since tithe was made a part of the uh, Old Testament Mosaic law? Is it a sin for New Testament Christians to tithe? Well, the Bible says if you, as far as if you're looking at it from the Mosaic law standpoint, the Bible says that if you try to keep even one part of the law, if you break even one part of the law, then it is sin. So he said there was no way that we could fulfill the entire law. So if you're looking at it from the law standpoint, then yes, it is a sin. Um, the New Testament after the cross states that you give with your heart. It talks about giving with your heart, with your heart desire, because it might be more than a tenth. Um, so um, yes, if we try to hold anything applicable to the law, that is wrong because Jesus says we can't, we can't withstand the law. And that's why he gave us those two major commandments. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, different op opinion? So then all those people that were following corrupt little dollar and that false doctrine, should they go and repent because they were falsely taught? Okay, so here's how, here's, a, let me, let me, let me answer, uh, Vanessa, and I'm going to answer uh, Tim. So first of all, this is kind of a trick question. Uh, I don't know if y'all caught that. This is just kind of a, tr a trick question. Okay, so yeah, the tithe was put under the law. That was codified under the law. But also remember that during the study, we learned that the tithe predated the law. Okay, so if you have a Christian who wants to give a tenth of their income, which is not a biblical thing, by the way. Yeah, who, who's that that just said something? Oh, no, I, I didn't want to cut it off. Okay, all right, I heard something. All right, so, so, so if you have a Christian who wants to pay a tenth of their income, which is not an actual biblical tithe and according to the way the scriptures lay out what a tithe is um giving a tenth of your income to god is not wrong it's not wrong at all unless okay so i hope you're holding on you know to your seat here unless you're not doing it in faith whatsoever is not a faith is sin is what the bible says so if you've the purpose in your heart that god kind of set a good standard for uh you know what we should give even though it was agricultural back then i want to give money now and and i don't feel any compulsion to give 10 percent at all none i know that i'm not under a curse if i don't give 10 percent. i know that i'm not robbing god but i still consider that a good standard for myself you know and i want to give a tenth of my income not under compulsion there's no problem with that, all right? I personally wouldn't call it a tithe, okay? Even though, you know, it's a tenth. And then I would personally, you know, say to anybody that if I was discipling them, you know, you know that's, that's God said a minimum, okay, in, in the Old Testament. And actually, it was actually more than 10%. When you add up all of the tithe, um, the different tithes that were in the, in the, in the Old Testament, it works out to around, I think it was like 20 or 23%, okay? But anyway, if you're not doing it out of compulsion, then I don't see a problem with it, but it's not an actual tithe, um, even though you may be calling it a tithe. So hopefully that makes some sense um, to you, Vanessa, because you do have people who, who you know, want to give a tenth of their income because that's what they were taught. So if they're giving it out of compulsion, yeah, they're wrong. If they're giving it to try to keep the law, yeah, they're wrong. They're trying to keep one point of the law and they're responsible for all of the points. But if they understand all of that and they're not giving it under compulsion and they want to just give because I, they think that's a good standard for themselves and they can give it out of a cheerful heart, I don't see an issue with that at all. And so to Tim's point, should individuals who were taught these tithing things, um, should they repent? Of God, if they were given under compulsion, yeah, I say they should uh, repent because they're trying to give under the law, and you can't mix law with grace. Okay, and so um, now that they've learned these things and they understand these things, they need to understand that they have liberty in Christ. 
that if they still want to give 10%, but not under compulsion, not under any responsibility of the law, they can do that if they want to. They can give 5% if they want to. They can give 90% or 100% if they want to. In the New Testament, um, the believers got together. They sold all of their possessions. They had all things common, okay? And they were able to take care of each other that way. So some of us who may have more resources than others, and this gets to uh, the, the, the last question here, some of us who may have more resources have more of a responsibility. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. Okay, so we have a responsibility with the things that God has given us, and that includes our, our money. So with that being said, let's answer the last two questions and wrap it up. Can a Christian rob God of tithes? Can a Christian rob God of tithes? No. I heard, I heard Miguel say uh, no. And you're absolutely right. How can a Christian rob God of tithes if tithing does not um, have anything to do with the Christian, but it has to do with Israel and specifically the Levitical priesthood um, in Israel? So a Christian was never a part of that. A Christian is not mentioned in those passages anywhere or thought of in those passages anywhere. So therefore, a Christian cannot rob God of tithes when we are not required required to tithe in the first place, okay? And that leads us to our last question. And I kind of sort of answered it a little bit for you already. What is a Christian's obligation as a steward of God's provision? What do y'all think? I think back in, um, Tim answered, or he brought up a point in Deuteronomy, um, i trying to remember the verse, it was the 24th and 24th, 24th. 24th, 25th verse in reference to the, the widows and the orphans. If you bring that up to today's current times, if you see a homeless person or you see a, there's a family in need, wherever you can be a blessing to someone, um, and it's not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing or vice versa, but it's being responsible with the money that God has blessed you with. Some people donate to charity. Some people you know, give inconspicuously and anonymously, anonymously to, um, to different things. So um, God has blessed us to be a blessing, um, wherever that blessing may be. So I think that verse was very applicable to today's time. If you're, that was a scripture verse. If, you're, if your brother needs a, a coat, don't send him away for reason. Give him a coat. If he needs um, the shoes, give him some shoes. So I think that has everything to do with our finances, whether it be our finances, anything um, of our possessions, food, um, clothing, money, um, we could use that as a, another guideline, our obligations as being steward with what God has given us to be a blessing to others in need. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I got a scripture that's pulled up and anybody else that have any comment on that is free to comment. Um, the scripture tells us in, in Corinthians, this is Paul, uh, letter to the church at Corinth. Every man, according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So whatever it is that you purpose in your heart to give, if you purpose in your heart to give 10% and you know you're not giving it out of compulsion or grudgingly or you feeling under the law and that's your, what you want to do as a, as a standard for yourself, give it. If you give it with a cheerful heart. If you can't give it with a cheerful heart, give something less. You know, if you can give 30, 40, 50% or 100%, depending on what your circumstances are, give it. Do churches really have needs out there? Yes. Should we be mindful of those needs? Yes. Not to the point where they're trying to pimp the congregation, so you have to have some discernment, but don't have a hard heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. All right? So if your treasure is, is, is you know, in your in your money then that's where your heart is and you can't serve god and money you can't you can't serve the both so you should be able to to give and to communicate to take care of your local body you know if you have one to support uh the missions of god you know if you're able to do this and sometimes you're going to be able to do it sometimes you're not going to be able to do it you know god understands that but whatever you do it should not be grudgingly it should be out of a out of a cheerful heart. 
So I want to kind of close it uh, with that um, and let you know that, you know, this is, you know, what we find when we look in the scriptures, that the purpose of the tithe, you know, was for the Levitical priesthood, for them to be able to have an inheritance, and for them to have communion um, with God in the service of, of their duties. And, you know, ultimately, what we give to God is about our relationship and our desire to have communion with God and, and to rejoice in God. And we should be able to do that, not just through our money and whatever we decide to give cheerfully, but through our time and through other methods and, and growing closer uh, with the Lord in all things that we do. But particularly in this area of money, that's a sore spot for a lot of people um, in America and in other places. So with that, I'm going to close it out for comments. I'm going to ask you if you have any final comments that you want to share or any uh, uh, verse that, you know, you might want to, to review real quick. We're at the end. So uh, I'd ask you to make it quick if you can. If it's going to be longer, then we'll pray. And then you can hang on the line and we can have a further. Uh, yeah, God bless everybody. Uh, How you doing, brother? God bless everybody. Yes, I just want to make a quick comment that ever since our Lord said it is finished, many people lost their jobs. The Levites, the priests, they're no needed. They're not, they're not needed anymore. Once he said it is finished, that's it. The, the only temple that God ordained it, okay, it's no longer needed. So now, basically, uh, you know, in spirit and in truth, and we are the church people, and the His Spirit abides in us. So the old, the, the old Testament temple is not a necessity for some people. It is, but not for born again believers. And and I'll leave it like that. We continue to twelve o'clock in the morning. God bless everybody. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Amen. Are there any other comments before we go to a closing prayer? And then if there's any other discussion that needs to take place and you want to hang out on the, on the line, I will hang out with you. Um, otherwise, I want to let the people who want to go uh, off the call go and be respectful of your time. So are there any other quick closing comments? If not, we'll close it in prayer. Okay. I don't hear any other quick closing comments. So with that, um, uh, if, if you don't mind, Brother Tim, since this is your first time on, on, on the call, I'm going to call you out and ask you if you would be so kind, if you would close us in a word of prayer so those who want to uh, drop off can go ahead and drop off, and then those who want to stay on, if any, can go ahead and stay on, if you don't mind, Brother. No problem. Father God, I just ask that uh, thank you for allowing us to assemble today. Uh, thank, thank you for having the technology that we can reach brothers and sisters in Christ across the world. Thank you for giving Terry the wisdom to share and for people to put their input in, Lord, uh, specifically with this topic, Lord, that I would ask that um, we would leave here today with uh, some new knowledge and some wisdom where we can also not only be a blessing to our family, but to teach others what we've also learned as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. So for those who want to uh, go ahead and drop off, um, the Bible study has officially concluded. And for anybody else um, who wants to uh, stay on, if any, feel free. I'll stay on for a few minutes just in case. Thank you all. I, re I really appreciate uh, your time. You know, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. I was going to say about that verse about the, you know, by, by the wine of the strong drink. Um, you know, I used to go to a Pentecostal church and, you know, they want to declare that, you know, the wine wasn't wine, it was apple juice. And I'm like, really? But when you take them to that scripture, when you say strong drink, strong drink is a wine that could have been, liquor yeah. of some sort and they want to kind of disregard that but it's like it is what it is it's written yep and i'm like i didn't write it but you want to debate it you know what i mean so i think that's where you're talking about how people can twist the word to make it 
essential for what they're trying to teach or whatever agenda they're trying to push. Yeah, and it's, and, a, and a strange and the strange thing is if you go to the original um, meaning of the word in, in the original language, um, strong drink. That word, strong drink, in that particular passage. Hold on. Oh, here it is. In this particular passage that you referenced. So if you go and you look at the word itself, you look it up. Let's see. Uh, strong for soul. strong wine. A strong drink. This word "sakar" literally means strong drink, intoxicating drink, fermented or intoxicating liquor. Okay. There you go. So God has. Hey, listen. I, and this is a, a Bible study for a whole nother time, um, because we see verses in Scripture that you know wine is you know. Uh, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And they'll take and they'll harp on that verse, but they won't harmonize the other verses in scripture that like this one to talk about you can go out and buy strong drink. If the Lord is telling you you can do this, then it's not a sin. What is shown to be a sin in scripture is uh, excess and drunkenness uh, exactly. in scripture. So anyway, that's a, that's, that's a topic for... I guess a whole nother time that I'll get into because I know depending on the church you go to and the denomination that you go to, you know, they may teach it one way or the other. And, you know, some are too liberal with it and, and some are way too uh, strict with it. And, you know, the, the, the answer is there in scripture. You just got to, you know, harmonize it and, and, and be honest about what the scripture is actually saying. And if you do that, you can see, you know, what's going on, that there is, you know, a permissibility, but there is also a condemnation for those who would abuse it and go too far. And if you do that, then that's sin. So anyway, uh, thanks for bringing that up, bro. I, I appreciate that. Any other things that y'all want to bring up or talk to um, while you have me on the line? I'm going to bring up that Corinthians verse that you um, left off with as far as um, giving with your you know allowing with your heart i forgot that was second corinthians 9 7. yeah and oh wait if, can y'all even see the scriptures that i have up i just or y'all still see my notes no it you still have the blue letter bible it's just not at second corinthians 9 7. but i was just gonna make a um oh you said nine okay that scripture second corinthians 9 7. um as far as you know giving with what does it say? Um, every man according as he purpose in his heart, because when you're doing something and this, and I'm, I'm strictly talking about myself. Um, I, I thought I was doing a noble thing by offering a homeless person. Um, I, I think I offered him, I said, I wouldn't give him money, but I give him food. Bottom line is I got aggravated and irritated because they asked for something additional um, or, or the way about what I offered them. And, and, and then when I walked away, I didn't I have much conviction because if you're going to give something, and this can be even with the money in the church, it's just the overall principle. Your heart should be, your heart should be in the right place. You shouldn't do it begrudgingly. You shouldn't do it out of obligation. And you shouldn't do it, like you said, out of compulsion, just something you, that you've taught. It should be in your heart. And I think that's why that person is so um, prevalent to the study as far as every man according as he purpose in his heart. So let him give, because the lady that had one pence, however much that was, her heart was willing to give everything she had. And it didn't matter that someone else might have had a thousand dollars if they were just doing it for show and their heart wasn't into it. So God looks a lot at the heart and he looks a lot at your, the purpose behind your giving. Yeah. Um, and with the, 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 the other reference, this is another important reference when the guy was freed. Um, he owed someone. He owed. He owed someone money, and you know the story I'm talking about. And then they let him free with a small amount that he owed. Mm -hmm. And then that he saw the one that was free. He saw this. He saw the person that he owed, which was a much larger amount. And I know that's not dealing with the time, but the bottom line is, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart is. So um, even with giving, God's concerned about why are you doing this? What is, what is the purpose of your heart? So yeah. I just wanted to add those two things because I think that's hugely 
important, whether it be doing something for someone. Um, you can do a lot of great things, but if your heart isn't into the right place or it's not for God, then they're, they're not, they're pointless. Yep. So Jesus said, when you give, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Right. So, you know, what is your motivation for what you're doing? If you have a pure motivation, you shouldn't feel bad about what you do and what you give, no matter if it's a lot or a little. Um, you know, so you do have to check yourself in that regard. So thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. You're welcome. Anything else? Anything else? All right. I don't. Oh. Okay. Yeah, my yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you. You want to go first? I was just going to. You, you were talking about earlier about is it possible? Well, you know, is it still possible that we can rob God? Obviously, not with the tithe because we're not required to give the tithe. Right. But just like uh, Vanessa was saying, you know, uh, God deserves nothing less than the absolute best of our time and our attention, our obedience, our resources. And so, you know, when we're, I think we, we end up robbing God when we're stingy with that, when we neglect making time to pray and worship and especially serve the needs of others like the orphans uh, right. and the widows. Yeah. Yep. So, so Carrie makes a very valid point. Thank you, bro. That my, my specific question, it was a very tailored question was, can a Christian rob God of tithes? But Carrie hits on a, a, a deeper element of it, right? That yes, we can't rob God of tithes because the tithe does not, uh, we're not responsible for the tithe, but you can definitely rob God in other ways. And Carrie mm -hmm. just broke down some of those other ways um, that you can still rob God. So you have to be careful. Even as a Christian, you have a responsibility. We've been given much more than those Old Testament saints, right? They only had the Holy Spirit to come upon them in the Old Testament. We have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us as a New Testament Christian. So we should be empowered to do a whole lot more and, and think much more on the mind of Christ um, than anybody in, in the Old Testament. So thank you, brother. I appreciate that. That's a very uh, a good point uh, that I hope people take to heart. So I think uh, we have one more comment out there. Yeah, I just want to say, as a babe in Christ, that once again, I will, I'll say that again, as a babe in Christ, I was at a temple and I heard somebody say, literally, quote, those who do not tithe are going to hell. I felt in my spirit, I said, wow. I went home, I prayed, searched the Bible, you know, this is the book above all books. And, you know, at an early time, the Holy Spirit let me know about the tithing. Basically, I was going against the grain because everybody, I'm talking about everybody, you know, no one ever spoke about this. I just kept it to myself, but I knew in my heart. And what put the what what uh what that in the eye was the part when Ananias, Ananias and Zacharias they sold all their possessions and they were killed not because you know they they could have kept their possessions was there it was in their power after they sold their possession it was in their power to do whatever they could have gained one dollar and kept the rest. The sin is that they, you know, they try to, it was a fraud. They believe that there's something that you're not. And that was my God is that also in the book of Acts, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't put no other burden among the Gentiles. It's, you know, and that opened my eyes and I said, wow, Lord, this is clear. This is clear, clear, clear. Personally, I know people who had a fear and even guilt. And it's sad. Yep. Give, 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 but don't do it because, you know, it's, let me say something. It's easier to give money than to live right. Right. And to appease my you understand? Yep. So you think you're buying God and, you know, you're trying to. No, we don't do that. 
So, but that, that point is bondage, that point is fear, and we are not, you know, we are, we cannot be cursed. You know, we have been made free. We cannot be cursed. You know, we cannot be cursed. So basically, we could become stingy, yes, and that's bad, but by not tying in, I think it was funny, to tell you the truth, when I, when I saw Clarkville the other day, I, I called him, oh, look at this, I didn't believe it, because you don't, you don't hear that, you don't hear that true, and that's basically, that's true, you know, and you, we don't want to take away from those, it's just a point that we should not feel guilty, and it's un, an unnecessary weight and burden on your shoulders. Exactly. You know, seriously, people will lose their house. Yep. They'll lose their house. You know, I mean, is, is a pastor going to put you in his basement until you find another one? People lose their house. They go, they go crazy. Oh, 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 I'm trying to see. And basically, what's going on is you put your name, that's another topic. I don't even want to go there. Putting your name, everybody knows how much you do, and so you try to put, uh, you know, I have my reputation. God is going to trust with all that. You know, we have, we can have to trust the Lord. So, in the Lord, we have liberty, liberty, Amen. liberty, liberty. Amen. Some liberties we cannot, you know, abuse. You know, all right. things are what, and Paul said, all things are. But not all things edify. Not all things edify. So concerning the drink, I understand all that, but we have to be careful that we don't use that as a, you know, and come home and get us a ticket for driving 120 miles an hour and afterwards not only. Yeah. <laughs> all right, brother, God bless. All right, thank you, brother. I really, I really appreciate that. So uh, I, I think that's it. Is that it? Yep. Bye-bye. See you guys. God bless you. Thank you for uh, being on, brother. Take care. Uh, good evening. Uh, All right. Stop share and end. Oh, what's this chat?